prizes tonight for both excellence and just for luck. And you can decide which is which. <laughs> and there will be stories, wonderful, wonderful stories during uh, the last 22 years of the Ned Kelly Awards. We've had all kinds of different entertainments up here. We've had um, debates with frilly nippers and hard nipples. We've had, um, we've had uh, keynote speeches. But last year we did stories. And that's what we do best, really. All of us, whether you're a writer or a publisher or whatever, we're all just telling stories, trying to get it across. And so we've invited some brilliant storytellers to speak for you tonight. And I hope you really enjoy it. Now, to kick things off, um, of course, over the last uh, 22 years or so, the Ned Kellys have bumbled along brilliantly and made it every year. But in the last few years, it's really got snappy with the aqua. Australian Crime Writers Association with their own website, which if you haven't visited, you probably wouldn't be here. And uh, it, it, it is doing a marvellous job for all of us. And at the helm of this uh, marvellous organisation, well, he probably wouldn't say it's at the helm, but um, our next speaker, um, who is the hardest working man in crime writing today. Um, he's had too many numerous books to mention, or numerous books to mention, but he's got a new one out. Secrets She Keeps already climbing up the charts around the world. Uh, yeah, good on you. And he's probably in the second draft of his next novel anyway. So boring. Ladies and gentlemen, to uh, welcome you all here tonight and to present a tribute to Peter Corris, would you please welcome Michael Robotham. <laughs> I'll have you know, Jane, that I pressed the button and sent the new novel off at 5.30. I didn't think I was first, I didn't look at the running sheet. Okay, um, I'm doing this a bit arse and about because I'm, you know, uh, I, I actually have to clear out of here in about an hour or two because I've got to be in Sydney tomorrow morning at a crime festival called BAD, which is Australia's, uh, well, it's not, well, I suppose we've had the Crime and Justice Festival here in Melbourne, uh, which uh, is now no more sadly, but um, the BAD festival is beginning in Sydney tomorrow at the Crime and Justice Museum there, or the, the, and uh, or the Police Crime and Police Museum, and it's a great, great, great achievement. All these Saturday tickets have already sold out, so um, stay tuned for that. Um, I'm going to, before I talk about Peter Corris, I'm going to thank some people. I know this normally goes on at the end of the evening, but I'm not going to be around at the end of the evening. Um, so. Um, it's my sixth year associated with the Australian Crime Rights Association and these awards. Um, my time is such I don't know how much involvement I can have in the, in the coming years because I'm doing a lot more touring, but uh, it's been an, an utter privilege to be involved with such an amazing committee that we have. Um, I'm going to mention a few names. Uh, Karen Chisholm, our, our webmaster. Our social media coordinator, she's the beating heart of the organisation. She deals week in and week out with the complaints and the new members and the updates and the running of the association. She took on an extra role this year uh, and she worked with designers and artists to come up with a new trophy. So tonight, the winners tonight are going to get a new Ned Kelly Award. Um, I'll unveil it shortly. Uh, um, and you'll get to see it in a minute, but uh, it, is, uh, it is beautiful. Uh, I'm rather envious of the fact that um, I've got a couple of the Ned Kelly Awards on my shelves. I, I want to swap them over for the new one. Um, I want to thank Fiona Hardy, our... <laughs> down there. Our judge wrangler, who did a brilliant job keeping our judges in the loop, collating their shortlists, sorting out the conflicts in the process. She also kept the minutes at our meetings and, uh, and kept us all, um, all up to date. Our judges themselves did a sterling job. This is no small feat. Uh, our, our best fiction category had 59 entries that our judges had to read, um, which is, I think is a record number, um, which again, I think goes to the strength of crime writing in, in Australia. I want to thank our new committee members uh, who, and members who aren't here, Meg Van, who started this year, and our treasurer, David Wish Wilson. They helped judge the SD Harvey Short Story Awards, um, and you'll hear more of that later as well. Deborah Crabtree, who's most responsible for tonight. 
in uh, liaison with the Melbourne Writers Festival, getting this venue, uh, making sure we're all here at the right time, in the right place. I also want to uh, especially thank also uh, Robert Goodman and Lindsay Simpson, who are important members of the committee, who I'm sure are going to be taking on bigger uh, and better roles in the years to come. And I, I should actually acknowledge the Australian Copyright Association, or the Australian Copyright Agency, who are the major sponsor of the Ned Kelly Awards and have been for the last probably five or six years. They're a brilliant organisation that are fighting for the rights of our copyright holders. They had a big win this week. I'm sure some people followed the fact the Australian government have chosen not to go down the path of adopting an American fair use system for copyright. Um, if they had done, it would have severely impacted upon the incomes of Australian creators, Australian writers. It would have allowed our work to be used for virtually no payment unless we had the money and the time to fight every copyright infringement in court. Um, it was a great win and the Copyright Agency fought the good fight and I, I, I'm so proud of the, fact that, uh, of the fact that they've sponsored these awards again. And I finally want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. Um, the readers, the publishers, the writers, the shortlisted authors, you know, my partners in crime, the armchair sleuths, the sick puppies, you're all welcome. <laughs> um, somewhere down here I've got an award for Peter Corros. Someone's got, oh, thank you. That's the barrel girl. Thank you, Jane. You're a very, very capable barrel girl. Um, you often hear you often hear critics and people talk about um, someone being the king or the queen. I went to a library and I met Peter Corros for the first time, and I remember nervously telling him that one day I wanted to be a writer. And he could not have been more charming or encouraging, or more realistic, you know, explaining to me the discipline it took and how hard it is to make a living as a full-time writer. And I'd admired Peter Corus's novels since the early 80s, because when I first moved to Sydney, I, I grew up in very small country towns, and I was born in Casino, grew up in Gundagai, and um, I love telling the story that I'd never been in a building over three stories high when I came for my first job interview as a journalist at Fairfax. Um, so I got a job on the All Sydney Sun. I was a cadet journalist on an afternoon newspaper. I was chasing sirens around the city. But I knew nothing about Sydney. And I think, I'll tell you how naive I was actually. My, my, I was working nights and my driver and photographer could tell that they were working with a hayseed. And they thought, we're going to take you to a strip joint up in the cross. I was, I think I just turned 18 and they took me to a strip, and if I tell you, this strip joint was so low rent that the strippers had to put their own money in a jukebox and choose what song they were going to strip to. <laughs> and this little country boy, my jaw was on the floor as I'm watching this, and this beautiful Eurasian woman came up and draped herself over me, and I thought, Oh my God, I am in here. <laughs> Until the driver came up to me, my newspaper driver, and whispered in my ear, check out the Adam's apple. <laughs> and I said, the what? <laughs> he said, the Adam's apple. And I've gone, the what? <laughs> I had no idea that men had Adam's apples and women didn't. <laughs> uh, I was saved that night. but. The, that's how big a hasted I was, and I think I learned more about Sydney from reading Peter Corus's Cliff Hardy novels. That's how, that was my introduction really, to understand the mean streets of Sydney, uh, and, you know, in terms of the, the bouncers and the junkies and the bikies and the con men and the white collar criminals. It was Peter Corus that taught me about those things. So. I know I'm here tonight to sort of honour Peter, um, and there are so many writers here tonight that owe a, an enormous debt of gratitude to Peter. We're standing on his shoulders. He paved the way. He kicked down the doors. He convinced Australian publishers that Australian readers wanted to read Australian stories. Up until Peter began writing, very few significant crime novels had ever been set in Australia. Um, and there are obviously some famous ones, Alan Davitt and Arthur Upfield and John Lang and John Cleary had written books. 
but there weren't many. And so suddenly Peter came along, and it took him five years to get the first Cliff Hardy novel published, The Dying Trade. I mean, that's how, again, because publishers didn't think Australians wanted to read Australian crime novels. And Peter, had, had, while living in San Francisco, he'd read the works of Ross MacDonald and Raymond Chandler, and he'd come up with this idea of transporting that hard-boiled Californian private eye into an Australian setting. And because he was struck with the similarities between San Francisco and Sydney. And, and Cliff Hardy was Australia's answer to Philip Marlowe and Sam Spade and Lou Archer. Since The Dying Trail was published in 1980, Peter Koros has published on average two fiction books a year for the last 37 years. Um, he's found a living in a trade and survived by ducking and weaving and doing what he can as a writer. Now Cliff Hardy has aged, he hasn't aged in real time, otherwise he'd be in his 70s now. When he started he was just shy of 40, 37 years later he's just over 50, I wish I could age like that. <laughs> He's a big bloke, very fit, head of wiry dark hair, craggy face. He doesn't like greed, corruption or hypocrites. A few years ago I edited a collection, actually it was for the Australian Crime Rights Association to raise money, called If I Tell You I'll Have to Kill You. And anyone interested in crime writing should pick that up. because It's uh, essays by 22 of Australia's best crime writers about how they got into this, how they write, why they write, what you should read. And Peter Corris wrote in his essay, after writing virtually every day for over 30 years, it has become something like breathing. Stop it and I die. I am addicted to writing. Like a smoker who claims not to be addicted to nicotine, but the gestures, the cigarette selection, the lighting, the ashing, the stubbing out, I am addicted to the process. Turning on the computer, getting the file up, tapping the keys, saving, storing on the memory stick. But just as the smoker is kidding him or herself about the nature of the dependency, I have to admit that my dependency is also emotional and psychological. Well, Peter Carey, sorry, Peter Corus is still breathing. <laughs> Got that right. He's still breathing, but he, he has written his last novel. Uh, Win, Lose or Draw was published in January. Uh, and it's sad to see him go, but I think he should be incredibly proud of the prodigious body of work he's generated and he's thrilled readers, he's never taken them for granted and he has, and, and we, so many of Australian writers are standing on his shoulders. So I thank Peter, I thank his wonderful wife, Jean Bedford, I thank his three daughters and grandchildren who shared his life. He's already won the Lifetime Achievement Award but we're giving him another award tonight to add to his collection. You'll get a better look at this later. This is a wonderf wonderful Ned Kelly mask on, a, on a, a polished piece of red gum. They're beautiful. They're handcrafted in the Pyrenees in Victoria by Adam Donison from an original design by Bernard Abadie. And the red gum was supplied by Daryl Driscoll. Uh, it is absolutely beautiful. As I said, I wish I had a couple of these at home. Um, this is for Peter Corris. It says, the Australian Crime Writers Association congratulate Peter Corris, the creator of Cliff Hardy, on his brilliant career. Uh, and I'm going to end, actually. I know Shane Malone is in the audience. He's going to come up in a minute and tell a story. But in sort of working out what I was going to say tonight, I came across a brilliant piece that Shane wrote in The Australian uh, about Cliff Hardy. He, he describes, Shane describes Sydney as being all logjam traffic and surf and sleazeball with giant cockroaches and bent coppers named Chuck and Jonesy and Lawsy and Nifty and Mr Big and Mr Sin and Carlotta and the New South Wales Wright with hose downable pubs and rugby thugs and old men with bare leathery chests walking fox terriers across wet sand and amid this swarming and pulsating 4.5 million human beings of humidity fevered real estate maddened thonged and singleted human beings came a lone man staggering down a back lane in glebe a man with a sour taste of yesterday's twoers in his mouth and the ring of deliberate lies in his ears a man who has been bludgeoned and coshed and bashed and biffed and set up who has been fucked with and fucked over and when he manages to get lucky sometimes just plain fucked. <laughs> and as he catches his breath against the ramshackle back fence of the only unrenovated knocking shop left in the old neighbourhood, 
and tilts his head back and draws a deep lungful of the fetid corruption stinking air. <laughs> we glimpse his beaten up but not beaten down features and we recognise them as surely as we would recognise the silhouette of the opera house or the coat hanger profile of the harbour bridge. For we know this man of old. We love this man. He is Cliff Hardy. He is the creation of Peter Corus and he belongs to us all. Thank you, Peter Corus.